Your circumstances do not define what you are capable of. Let me say this again because it is something that is very near and dear to my heart and something that hopefully I've been living out that you guys have seen on my channel over the last year. Your circumstances do not define what you are capable of, okay? Where you live, your budget, those are your circumstances and they do not define you, okay? Don't listen to anyone that tells you that you need to have a big fancy workshop with really high-end expensive tools to build your dream guitar. In fact, I built this sweet bass out of junk pile wood that I found, two by fours, an OSB, and some parts that I got on Amazon for cheap. And I did it out of my motorhome. No dedicated workspace and only minimal hand tools. So let me tell you guys, if you've been putting off building your dream guitar because of your circumstances, you think you don't have a big enough workshop or the right tools, I'm here to tell you that it is well within your grasp. We're gonna talk about the exact tools that you need and the tools that people say you need that you don't actually need in this video. Now, a couple years ago, I made a video very similar to this. Of course, I did it inside the comfort of my home workshop, which I no longer have. Obviously, my circumstances have changed. I no longer have a nice, big, comfortable workshop to work in. So if you wanna see how you can build your dream guitar without letting your circumstances define what you're capable of, stick around. I'm Dan, this is Guns and Guitars. Let's get started. If you don't have access to a workshop, or a garage, or even a patio where you can set up a workbench, you can still do this. But what you do need is a work surface. And so for that, I highly recommend this Keter work table. Now, this thing is amazing. What I do would not be possible without this workbench. It is my number one tool for guitar building because I need to have a work surface. And this thing collapses down so small and it fits in the storage bays of my motorhome. It fit in my fifth wheel. If you live in an apartment or just you know a tiny crammed space where you just don't have room to build a dedicated workbench, this is what you need. And this thing specifically is great. I really like this Keter workbench because it comes with these clamps and a slot on the table. So you can hook them in, clamp down on what you're working, and it's just, it's just great. Like I said, what I do would not be possible without this. And probably the best feature of this thing is how quickly it sets up and tears down. I mean, it's literally less than five seconds you are up and running. So again, if you don't have a dedicated workspace, don't let that stop you from getting into this hobby. You can pick up one of these Keter workbenches. It's amazing. It really is amazing. All right, we're just gonna keep cranking through this because we got a lot to cover. So we're gonna dive right into the neck and fret work. Now, you guys know that the biggest difference between a cheap guitar and an expensive guitar is how much work the luthier put into the neck and fret work. You can build a really high-end sounding, really high-end playing guitar out of a cheap guitar kit if you upgrade the electronics and you put in the wrench time on your neck. So we're gonna spend a good deal of time talking about what we need to do to make a neck good and playable. The first thing that you need is a notch straight edge. Now they sell these things on Amazon and Stumac, even Crimson Custom Guitars and stuff like that. They're not expensive, but they're not cheap especially for a tool that you use just once during the course of a guitar build and not even for that long. Basically the whole point of a notch straight edge is just to make sure that your fretboard is level before you level off your frets. So I actually don't recommend that you buy a notch straight edge. I recommend that you make one. Now I have a video dedicated to making your own homemade guitar tools where I go into depth on how I make these notch straight edges, okay? I even went into it very briefly on my great guitar build off build, how I made this custom 30 inch bass scale notch straight edge from a ruler that I got from Walmart. Same as this, okay? This has three different scale lengths on it. I've got a standard Fender guitar length scale, a standard Gretsch and Gibson length scale, and a 34 inch bass scale. Now. I was doing a 30 inch base for my great guitar build off. So that's what this one was for. I made one specifically just for that one build. It was cheap. I knew I was only gonna use it one time, but I have room to put on more scale lengths, which I'm gonna need to do for this project because I realized that none of these scale lengths are proper for this neck. So again, that's why I don't necessarily recommend investing a lot of money into a notch straight edge unless you are gonna be doing a whole lot of the exact same scale length guitars. To me, that's no fun. I wanna build every kind of guitar there is, right? So, making your own out of a cheap Walmart straight edge. Okay, now once you have leveled off your fretboard, the next step is you need to level off your frets. 
And for that, you need a sanding beam. Now, again, in my video about how to make your own do-it-yourself luthier tools, I have an idea where you can make one out of a level. I did that for years and it worked great. So if you already have a level, you can already make this tool yourself. If this is a hobby that you're gonna be getting into and doing a lot more of, I do recommend getting a dedicated sanding beam for this process because this is a tool that you will use on every single guitar or bass that you build. Now mine is actually just this aluminum T-bar that I got on Amazon. I bought it already precision leveled. So basically to make it a leveling beam, all I do is I add some masking tape, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, and a little bit of super glue with some 400 grit sandpaper and bam, I've got a nice sanding beam. Now this sandpaper has seen enough projects, it's time to be replaced. All you gotta do is peel off the tape and replace it with fresh tape and fresh sandpaper. So it's a super easy process. Once you've leveled out your frets, then you need to crown them back into a dome shape, right? And so for that, I have a specific tool that I use, but before we get into that, I wanna remind you that I already posted a video on a really cheap and easy DIY tool that you can use for this process. So if you don't have a budget for this, or if this is a one-time project and you don't wanna spend a lot of money, then definitely do that tool first. But if you really want to save a lot of time, if this is a hobby that you are getting into more seriously, um, I highly recommend the Baroque Fret Crowning File. Now they are on their new fourth generation file, which as you can see is a square shape as opposed to the round or octagonal shapes that they've had in the past. It's got three different sizes on it for crowning different fret sizes. The unfortunate thing is that two of the sizes are useless. They're too big to crown frets. So you only use the small side on it, but they've added this fourth side now that's just a flat file, which is really great because we'll get into this in a little bit, but once you're done crowning, you need to double check that all your frets are still level. And if you need to make some adjustments, you can do that with the flat file really easily. This, in my opinion, is probably the best iteration of the Baroque fret file to date, even better than the first gen. I had my doubts about it when I first started using it, but now that I've used it for a little bit, I can honestly say that I love this one the best, even though two of the fret file sizes are useless, just for the one that is perfect, and for the flat file all in one tool, I think it is worth the, I think it goes for about $39. I think it's totally worth that because you're really getting two tools in one. I also really like the square shape because it's really easy for me to see that I have it perfectly straight up and down when I'm crowning my fret and it helps me get that perfect dome shape. It's not oblong or leaning one way or the other because I had the, the fret file off kilter while I was doing it. So this is a very handy little tool. I highly recommend it if you're gonna be getting into this, but I do understand that $40 for a tool that you may only use one or two times is kind of steep. So again, if you're only gonna be building one or two guitar kits, as if that's really a thing. Once you build your first one, you realize that it's a never ending lifelong hobby, right? So once you build your first one and you use the DIY tool, and then you decide, oh, this really sucks. I wanna be able to do this faster on my future kits. Pick yourself up one of these. I'll put an Amazon link down in the description. All of the links in the description are affiliate links. So it's a great way that you can help me continue doing what I do on my channel by making a purchase from those links. It doesn't cost you any more money, but I do earn a commission, so I would appreciate that. Now, once you crammed all your frets, you need to make sure that they are still level, right? And you do that by using a fret rocker, okay? Now, this is a fret rocker from Crimson Custom Guitars, and I absolutely love this thing. I only have this one because they sent me two with my set of tools for the Great Guitar Build-Off. And as you guys know, I gave away that whole pro luthier set of tools to the person who purchased my great guitar build off. I do absolutely love it and I do absolutely use it. Before I had this, I used an old credit card, okay? And this works just fine as long as you're careful not to bend the plastic while you're using it. But just take an old credit card, run it across a known flat surface with some fine grit sandpaper to make sure that it is perfectly precision flat. Do that on both sides, right? And then you have a fret rocker that will serve you perfectly well, even up into the tiny frets. And if you wanted to, you could even cut off an angle of it so that it looks like this thing, right? So that you have, you know, three or four different sizes on it. And this will serve you really well and it won't cost you anything except for an old credit card that you were gonna cut up and throw away anyway, right? So highly recommend this. Again, if you're gonna be doing it just once or twice, this will get you by. If you're gonna be doing it, Often get one of these. I'll put an Amazon link in the description for my US buyers and I'll put a link to Crimson Custom Guitars for my European uh, friends out there. All right, now that we are leveled, crowned, 
double checked for leveling, corrected if we needed to with the flat side of our fret file. Now we can move on to polishing. Again, something that you can do for super inexpensive, okay? All you need are some small pieces of ultra fine grit sandpaper. This is 600 grit, 800 grit, 1000 grit, um, and then steel wool, okay? Just, uh, this is a quadruple lot steel wool, so four zeros steel wool. And this is what I use to polish my frets for a really long time and I got really good results. But again, I found a much faster and more effective way. And that's with my Dremel tool. I highly recommend you get some kind of rotary tool for this hobby or for just do-it-yourself projects in general. You will be shocked at how versatile these tools are. Now, obviously I have mine rigged up with a flex shaft kit because operating this thing, it's big and heavy and clunky and you don't have super good control of it, but you get this thing and you can hold it like a pencil and you can do some really fine detailed work. And I use this thing for so many other things, but one thing that I definitely use it for that has been a huge time saver is I use it to polish frets, okay? I just put a cloth polishing wheel on there with some polishing compound. I go straight from crowning with my fret file. It's a fine enough grit that I can go straight from this to this and I'll be left with perfectly glassy smooth frets, okay? Now, if I skip the sanding in between, you know, I used to do crowning and then sanding and then polishing, and that will get you like perfect, like mirrored glass frets, okay? But I've started skipping the sanding step because I found that my guitars play just as good if I just go straight to the polishing. They're not as shiny and as beautiful, but I found that it doesn't disrupt the playability of the guitar and it saves me a buttload of time if I just go straight from crowning to polishing. Okay, so this is the fastest way. You've seen me do it a lot. I have a dedicated video again on, gosh, this video sounds like it's just a pitch for you to watch other uh, videos. In fact, I might as well just make a playlist out of this, okay? Um, if you just continue on in this playlist, then <laughs> you will see the fastest way to crown and polish frets is this tool. Now again, I sound like a broken record. If you're only gonna be doing this hobby once or twice, you don't need to invest in a rotary tool. But if you are a do-it-yourselfer, I highly recommend this. Though it is not absolutely critically necessary, I love it and it saves me a bunch of time doing the jobs that I hate the most, okay? Fret work, and then we'll talk about sanding later. Now, I nearly forgot to mention a fretboard guard, okay? When you're crowning and polishing your frets, you want to protect your fretboard from getting scratched or marred. And I found that I actually don't use a fretboard guard anymore. What I do use is quality masking tape. What I found is that if you just use a high quality masking tape, that will protect it and it won't leave any sticky residue. And you can pick it up and move it from fret to fret the same way you can with a fretboard guard. Now the quality of the masking tape, like we're gonna talk about later with sandpaper, the, the type of sandpaper that you use really matters. The type of masking tape that you use really matters. Now, the reason why I'm not showing you the roll right now is because I can't find it and it is frustrating me to no end because I just bought a brand new roll and I already lost it. What really frustrates me is actually they keep changing the color and the name of the type of masking tape that I like to use. Currently, it is called Scotch Ultra Sharp Lines Multi-Surface. Um, before that, it was called Outdoor. Before that, it was called Scotch Platinum. Um, but it's not your typical paper uh, type of masking tape. It is more of a plasticky consistency. It's got a little bit of stretch to it, but most importantly, it's far more durable, again, because it's plasticky instead of papery. So it can take a beating from your crowning file and from your sanding beam. But most importantly, you can leave this stuff attached for weeks on end, and then when you go to peel it off, it's gonna peel off super easy, and you won't have to worry about a sticky residue, okay? It's, it's the same paper that you saw me pull off of my sanding beam. It used to be yellow, now it's blue. It was a light blue, then it was a bright yellow, now it's a dark blue. And like I said, they keep changing the name, but that's what it's currently called. Again, I'll put a link down in the description and hopefully I can find my roll because probably my favorite thing about having my roll of masking tape on my workbench is that it makes an excellent cup holder for my coffee cup. <laughs> now I know what you guys are thinking right now. Where did I get this amazing sweater? All right, I know you guys want one of these. Well, the good news is they are officially for sale on my website, gunsandguitars.net. And for a limited time, I'm gonna give you guys a coupon code, gunsandguitars, to save you 10% off of any of my new merchandise. Now, a lot of you international viewers have been asking for less American-inspired designs. Um, this is what you get. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
I heard you. And we came up with a new international friendly logo. Check this out. Obviously there is a guitar. There's also a gun trigger in there if you are looking for it, but anyone that's not looking for it would be completely unassuming. So this is safe to wear in other countries. It's safe for your kids to wear at school. We got shirts and hats with the new logo on it, as well as shirts and sweaters with the new American flag logo. So remember, you can save 10% for a limited time using coupon code guns and guitars and my Patreon supporters will get a coupon code for 20% off. 20% off actually means that I make zero profit on this. So you Patreon supporters, you guys get it for my cost. Getting into now, I guess it'd be setting up your body before you finish it. You definitely probably wanna have a power drill driver sort of thing, okay? Now this is obviously a really nice one because I do a lot more DIY projects than just building guitars. You definitely don't need one that's that nice. Just a typical $10 one that you can get at a garage sale or Facebook Marketplace, a corded drill will do just fine. Because occasionally you're gonna come across a kit where the holes are not drilled properly, so you're gonna have to fill and redrill them so that everything aligns properly. And then also there are kits that just have holes that are not drilled. So at some point you are gonna need to drill holes. So you will need a drill driver of some kind. So I realized something as I was laying out my beautiful picturesque thumbnail right here, that there's an extremely important tool that I forgot to mention in this video. And that is extra long drill bits. Now I highly recommend these extra long drill bits in both eighth inch and quarter inch. Eighth inch for drilling your bridge ground connect wire and quarter inch for drilling any other wire cavities that you need for your pickups or output jack or whatever. So you definitely need the extra long drill bits to get those really steep angles in order to be able to feed your wires through without punching through the back of your guitar body. So definitely something that I totally forgot, but is totally necessary. Now the finishing process really comes down to this. How much time do you want to spend sanding? I will tell you guys the cheapest way to get a job done except for when it comes to sanding, because I hate it so much, I will buy whatever tools or products required to make sure that I spend the least amount of time doing it. But my number one most used tool when it comes to sanding would be my DeWalt Orbital. I got this thing on Amazon for I think around $50, and this thing has been an absolute godsend, okay? I have used standard palm sanders, mouse sanders, oscillating multi-tools with sanding detachments. This is the most productive and it leaves the least amount of trace behind. You will not know that something was sanded with a power sander if you use a random orbit sander. Now, when it comes to the actual sanding discs, um, again, it's something that I don't necessarily cheap out on, but I have found a good value sanding disc that will get the job done, and that's Duragold. Okay, Duragold makes a really high quality sanding disc and these are very productive and they last a long time as opposed to the you know cheap bulk buys that you can get on Amazon. Um, this is a good value. Out of all the ones that I've tried, these tear up the least. They do a really great job and they don't cost a lot of money, especially you know the more that you buy. Like this is a pack of 50, okay? Um, if I'm in a place where I can't receive packages from Amazon, the next best value I would say are Gator. And you can get these at Walmart or Lowe's. Um, they are very reasonably priced and they are every bit as good as the Durgold. The Durgolds are just a little bit cheaper if you buy them on Amazon. A huge game changer to the random orbit sander that I only found super recently are these foam sanding pads. Okay, these allow the sandpaper to contour to a surface that is not perfectly flat. Because up until then, I could only use this thing to sand the flat surfaces of a guitar, which you guys know is not very many surfaces. So it got the bulk of the sanding done, but I still had to do a ton of hand sanding. Buying these little foam pads, you can see I have them, I have two of them strapped up to a medium grit and a fine grit so that I can do, you know, the bulk and then the touch up. Um, and I just leave them attached because the more you attach and detach them, the more these are prone to falling apart and I don't want to have to replace them super often. Um, but I am going to buy a couple more of these because they turned out to be a super huge game changer. I was able to get into a lot of those um, sort of dips and grooves and contours a lot better than I could with this thing by itself. And so huge game changer for me, well worth the money. Two pack of these I think was $9. So definitely well worth the investment if this is something you're gonna be doing on a regular basis. Or again, if you have other DIY projects that you do, I use my orbit sander so often because like I said, I really hate sanding. All the power sanders and power sanding attachments in the world will not get you out of hand sanding entirely, okay? There are spots on a guitar that you will just never get an orbital to fit into. And so 
there is gonna be some hand sanding required and I hate it, um, which is why I use 3M Sandblaster Pro, not sponsored. This is the only brand of sandpaper that I use because it is so productive. It just, what it equates to is less time sanding, which is the most important thing to me, right? Uh, as you can see, I am I just have a pathetic amount of 220 left, so it's time to refill that. Sandblaster Pro, it doesn't clog, it doesn't rip and fall apart and tear up, and it doesn't lose its sand on it. It'll last you multiple projects, which is fantastic because it helps you kind of regain the money back because this sandpaper does cost about twice as much as your standard sandpaper. I highly recommend 3M Sandblaster Pro. Um, I'll link it in the description. I think I get it at Lowe's or Home Depot. I don't remember which one, but this is one of those that you can only find at certain hardware stores, but it's the one, I mean, I've used every type of sandpaper and that is the one. I'm spending a lot of time talking about it because it's that important, okay? I, I told you earlier on where you can cheap out in guitar kit building tools. Don't cheap out on the sandpaper unless you just like putting in a lot of extra time and effort that's not necessary. All right, when I was digging out my electronics wiring stuff, I found my roll of masking tape. Solve that mystery. I can go back to not being so frustrated at life. Okay, so once you've got your guitar finished, you've done all of your sanding necessary, you've applied whatever finish you want, whether it's like stains and oils or paints and stuff, and then you've done your wet sanding and your clear coat and you've buffed it all out. I'm not gonna get into any of that stuff because it's all purely subjective based on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and honestly, when it comes to finishes, I'm not the expert. But what I feel like I am the channel for is awesome guitar wiring, especially on a budget, because thankfully these days, there are some really nice budget-friendly options for guitar wiring. So we're gonna start with the most obvious. You need a soldering iron, okay? Now this soldering iron kit I got on Amazon, I think for less than $20, maybe even less than $15, I don't recall. Um, you'll have to verify the link in the description for the actual price, but I think, I think it's $15. Um, it comes with several tips. I've still only used one tip and I have wired, I don't know how many guitars with this soldering iron and it has been awesome. It's very easy to control the temperature. It heats up really fast. Um, it maintains an even temperature. Now, I couldn't tell you exactly how many hours are on this thing. All I can tell you is that it's an awful lot because back when I had an actual workshop, it was not uncommon for me to accidentally leave this thing on overnight for, or even for two or three days until I come back to the project and realize that I left it plugged in on accident. So this thing has ran, has ran so many hours. Now, one of the things, and one of the reasons why I think that this thing has lasted so long for me is that it's been properly maintained. And that's something that a lot of people don't tell you about soldering, is that you need to maintain your soldering iron and keep a nice clean tip. First thing, tip tinner. This is great for cleaning off what's left on there, like the oxidation and things like that. When it's hot, you just shove it down in there, cleans it up really good. And then whatever debris is still loose on there, you can use this little wire, uh, copper, I think it's copper or brass, like wire mesh thing. You just shove that in there and twist it around and that cleans off the tip really good and then you're ready to go for soldering. When it comes to the actual soldering, I have a specific solder that I absolutely love and it's this stuff right here. It is a 6040 rosin core wire. I know that a lot of countries don't allow this type of solder due to, I think it's the lead content or maybe the toxic fumes that it lets off, um, but it is available to use in America. So if you're in America, highly recommend this stuff. Now, a lot of people will tell you that it's nasty stuff, that you shouldn't breathe it. I am literally wiring in the most ventilated place possible the outdoors. So it's really not a concern for me. Um, this stuff is just really easy to use. It heats up at a very low temperature. So you have a lot less opportunity to burn out your electronics if you don't know what you're doing. I have a video actually, if you don't know what you're doing, on basic wiring soldering techniques. I'll go ahead and add that to this playlist so that you can just kind of see a brief tutorial how I wire all my guitars using this stuff. But this is the most easy soldering wire, in my opinion, to use. So the 6040 rosin core lead tin wire, I don't know. All right, when it comes to prepping your wires, you do need a set of wire strippers. I mean, if you're really careful with a knife or a pair of regular wire cutters, you might be able to strip them using that. This thing I'm telling you is a lifesaver. It's got different gauges from 16 all the way up to 26 gauge. And then, yeah, hookup wire. If you're gonna be doing a lot of wiring tricks like I do, um, I feel like that's the place where you can really show your customization options for building your dream guitar is by wiring it in ways that 
the guitars aren't wired from the factory, okay? The possibilities with wiring hacks are pretty much limitless. Um, so get yourself some good hookup wire. I think I use 24 gauge, if I recall correctly. So put a link to hookup wire, uh, really inexpensive stuff, works great. Works really good with the soldering iron and solder. And then if you're like me and you use cheap electrical components, like if you're buying, you know, aftermarket switches and pots and things like that to do your wiring modifications, I found that just a little spritz of deoxid D5 on a cheap pot or a cheap switch will protect it for life. Protect it from failing, protect it from getting scratchy or making, you know, popping sounds as you're operating it. Buy once, cry once, I buy a can of Deoxit D5 and then I can use the cheap electronics that come with the kit or I can buy cheap aftermarket stuff. Um, I just don't see the need to spend three or four times the price to get Borns or CTS pots when you can get the cheap unbranded ones and then just spray a little bit of this lubricant protectant in there and it will operate smoothly. I've never, anytime I've ever used this, I've never had one of those pots or switches fail on me. And then lastly, shielding. You wanna try to get rid of that nasty 60 cycle hum. I highly recommend this copper foil tape right here. This roll has lasted me, again, I don't know how many guitars, and I still, I would say I probably still have five or six guitars left on this roll, and I've probably used it on maybe uh, 10, guitars up until this point. So it lasts a really long time. It has conductive adhesive, so you can stick it to itself and it'll maintain continuity. That's the biggest thing when it comes to guitar shielding. So I would say that this is the cheapest option that will last you the longest. Definitely cheaper and will last you longer than guitar shielding paint. The only thing that might be cheaper is if you have stuff already that you can use. So a lot of my users tell me that if you have aluminum HVAC tape, then that works and the adhesive is at least conductive enough to maintain continuity. So I've not used it personally, but a lot of my viewers have told me that it works. What I have used before in the past is just standard heavy duty aluminum foil with a spray adhesive of some kind. Now, if you're not a crafty person, you probably don't already have spray adhesive. And if that's the case, just spend the money you would be spending on spray adhesive on this tape because it's probably about the same price. I think a can of spray adhesive costs about 10 or $15 and that's about what this stuff costs. So um, I would recommend just going straight for the stuff that's built for the purpose you're gonna use it for unless you have other projects in mind for the, the spray adhesive. And again, I have a video dedicated to that. I'll go ahead and add it to the playlist. All right, now if you're like me and you're kind of overbuilding guitar kits because they're too limiting on your creativity, you wanna be able to do more heavy mods, these are gonna be the tools that you will wanna look into. Now, this is the number one part where I feel like people on the internet try to discourage you from taking on a project like this. Because you see people when they're making their own guitar bodies, they are using really big, expensive tools like router tables and planers and table saws and band saws and drill presses and a whole plethora of other tools. So this is where the statement that I said in the beginning really comes into play. Do not let your circumstances define what you are capable of. And I'm gonna prove it to you next week as you watch me build this custom base that I've been working on the last couple of weeks. I built it entirely out of junk pile wood two by fours and OSB. And I did it with the tools that I'm gonna show you right here. I did it without a router table, without a planer, without a table saw, without a drill press, without X, Y, Z, okay? I did it just with basic hand tools that are within the realm of ownership of just about everyone, especially if you are resourceful in where you purchase them, okay? Walmart, Harbor Freight are great sources for this stuff. Even better, garage sales, Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, estate sales, you can find really good deals. For example, this jigsaw, okay? This is what I use to cut the shape of my body out. I got this at a garage sale for no joke, $5. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. So firstly, if you are just doing some heavy kit modding, let's say you wanna fit in some pickups that it wasn't designed for, I would say, you know, obviously you already need your drill, you already need your power sander, which is gonna help a lot, but this is where you might wanna think about investing in a router or if you already have a rotary tool of some kind, you might wanna invest in the router attachment kit for it or the multi-purpose cutting bits for it. You can remove a little bit of material with this thing. It's not gonna get you by as a complete router, but it will get you by for those light modifications. Um, and I actually used this instead of a router for a really long time until I finally broke down and I bought this little tiny trim router from Harbor Freight, again, 
I think it was like 30 or $40. Super inexpensive and totally gets the job done. I especially like that it's got a really small footprint. So if I wanna do some detail work on like a headstock or something, I'm not left with this massive plunge router footprint. Now, you have seen on my channel that I have a large Craftsman plunge router as well. The only reason why I own that router is because I found that one on Facebook Marketplace for the same price as this. I think I got it for $40 and it even came with some router bits. I like having two routers, um, especially like this one has a really small footprint, so it definitely can get in places where my big one can't. Uh, the big one's more powerful, so it's more productive for uh, bigger routing tasks, right? So I like having two. You obviously don't need two. You can get by with just the small one. So yeah, if you're getting into modifying guitar kits or building your own guitars, probably the router would be the first tool that I would recommend. The next tool that I'd recommend is a cheap set of files. These are great for just little intricate detail work. Again, I got these at Harbor Freight for, I wanna say it was like $3.99. And these are surprisingly good files for the price. I use these on pretty much every guitar build. You know, next time you're at Harbor Freight, just go ahead and pick up a set of these for, you know, three or four bucks, totally worth it. Um, glue, I mean, let's talk about glue, right? Okay, so this is something I didn't mention earlier that I probably should have. If you're building a set neck guitar, you need some glue to glue in your neck. Tight Bond Original is the only glue you should use for this job. And if this stuff is not available in your country, I don't know what to tell you. This is the best stuff. It's the only glue that I know of that actually creates a stronger bond than the wood itself. Meaning that you will break your guitar neck in half before your guitar joint comes loose. This kind of segues us to guitar bodybuilding. At some point, you're going to need to glue your wood together and you want to have the best and uh, strongest joints possible for that. When I was building my base, the, the, the base of the body was made out of two by fours glued together with copious amounts of tight bond. So this stuff is super strong um, and it, it, it really is, it's the only glue that you should have. Now when you're prepping your wood to be glued, most people will tell you you need a planer or a table saw in order to chew up your edges. And that's true to an extent. Again, if you use copious amounts of wood glue and you're not afraid of a little wood filler, you can just sand your wood raw with your orbital and just line up your edges the best that you can, glue it together with this stuff and clamp it down really good. Clamps, that's what we need to talk about. I don't even have any on my table. Let's talk about clamps because clamps are something you definitely need if you're gonna be making your own guitar bodies, okay? Now, again, one of the reasons why I absolutely love this Keter Workbench is that it comes with a couple of these awesome clamps, okay? Now, these are what I used to glue together the two by fours that I used to build my base body. So I was able to fit three in there. And then, so I did three, and then I did two more with these. You can buy bigger, longer clamps like this at Harbor Freight for really inexpensive. And if I had the room to store them in my motorhome, I would probably get at least a couple of those. But what I do get from Harbor Freight are these tiny little ones, and these are great for clamping a top down. So I used OSB on my ghetto junkyard build. You do need a bunch of these to clamp your top down on your body, um, just to make sure you get nice, good seams. You press out as much glue as possible, get as much wood surface contact as possible so that wood glue can really penetrate the surface of the wood to get the strongest bond possible. Um, these are like two or three dollars at Harbor Freight. And again, it's one of those things that like when I'm there, I just toss it in my cart because it's an extra two or three bucks. Over time, it costs you almost nothing and you can actually get a respectable amount of clamps. You can never have too many clamps. So I've got, I don't know, probably about a dozen of these that I use. You know, once your wood is glued together for your body, again, people will say that you need to run it through a planer to get it even. And yes, that is the right way to do it. And that will get you the fastest results. Again, just use my orbital sander. Took a little bit longer. I hate sanding. If I had room to put a planer in my motorhome, I might do it, but you can get by with this. So this is the biggest thing is like, I don't want you guys to think that you can't build your dream guitar because you don't have the space or the budget to buy some of those specialty tools that you're only gonna use for building a guitar body. Getting something like this that you're gonna use for a lot of different projects, it's also gonna be a lot cheaper and it will get you by. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I got this jigsaw at a garage sale for $5 and this is what I used to cut out the guitar body that I was building, and or bass body rather. And it took about 15 minutes to cut the shape out with this thing. Could I have done it faster with a bandsaw? Probably. Would I have gotten better results with a bandsaw? Probably. Is it worth the added cost and weight and space of a bandsaw? Absolutely not. 
unless you are building guitars all day, every day, I don't recommend you get a bandsaw, especially the size of bandsaw that you would need to be able to run through a guitar body. And so for that, man, a jigsaw, so much more handy. You can use it for other projects. Um, so I highly recommend doing a jigsaw. And obviously I can't put a link to a garage sale where you can get one for $5. So I'll just find um, a good link to Amazon where you can get a decent deal on one of these. Um, but again, be watching those garage sales, be watching those classifieds ads, see if you can pick up some of this stuff used. Now, when it comes to carving your guitar body, okay, this is where you put in the comfort carves, or if it's a carved top or an arch top, that'll take you a long time with some sandpaper. So I highly recommend for that task, an angle grinder. If you already have an angle grinder, all you need to do is buy a sanding flap disc. Okay, and these are what I use for carving a guitar body, a sanding flap disc will run you about four or five dollars, okay? An angle grinder, a cheap one, will run you about 15 or 20 dollars. Again, look for these things used. You can find them probably in the five dollar range in your local classifieds. And then the last tool that I recommend is definitely this rotary tool, and I've talked about it before already when we were talking about polishing. I talked about it briefly when we were talking about routing. Um, but this thing, it's so much more than just a polisher and a router. Especially if you put on some sanding drums, it's really good at just removing material just in small, precise areas. It's just a great all-around multi-tool. And I highly recommend, again, the flex shaft kit. That's gonna help you get the most money out of it. Um, you can cheap out on the rotary tool, although you definitely want one that at least has a uh, variable speed setting. This is a Black & Decker rotary tool. I keep calling it a Dremel. Um, but this is my favorite. I've had this from the beginning. I've had other Dremel brand tools that have actually crapped out on me. And this Black & Decker one is still running strong and it's variable speed. Now you might be thinking, this is all a lot of tools that I need to invest in to get into a hobby that I'm not sure that I like. Well, remember, start with this playlist and look at all the DIY tools that you can make out of stuff that you probably already have. And if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you likely already have a good base of tools to start with. Also something that I didn't mention is, I mean, look at how little space all these tools take up when you actually line them up together on the table. Okay, you can totally store all this stuff in just a plastic Rubbermaid tote and then fold up your work table and store it right next to it and you won't be out any space at all. I mean, really, I live and travel in a motorhome full time and I got room for this stuff. You got room for this stuff too. Definitely hit that subscribe button if you haven't already because next week I am gonna be showing you start to finish how I built that base from junk pile wood and random parts from Amazon using only the tools that I showed you in this video. Definitely stick around for the rest of the videos in this playlist so you can see how you can make your own tools and how to use them, more importantly. And until next time, remember, don't let your circumstances define what you're capable of.